this week on the WriterCon podcast. It was a long haul. And at one point, very early in the morning, going through one of those dark nights of the soul that every writer has, mm -hmm. I realized it was a simple equation. You wear them down or they wear you down. That's the mm -hmm. equation. And that's what I tell people. I said, you know, I used to know everything there was to know about books. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker books on writing, and Renee Gutteridge, best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Hey there, writers. Our guest today is John Woolley, one of my oldest and best writing buddies, someone who has managed to maintain a professional writing career now for more than five decades. To me, this is a great example of someone who may not be a household name like, say, Lisa Gardner, who's going to be next week's guest, but nonetheless, John has had an incredible career and sold a lot of books through sheer hard work and persistence and, of course, great talent. To me, oh, come on, you, you, you knew I'd work WriterCon into this somehow, right? <laughs> this is what's great about the WriterCon conference. There are so many wonderful, talented people that you soon see that there are many paths to success, writing success, many kinds of writing success, and whatever you think your path might be, it can be achieved. And speaking of people with long and successful writing careers, Renee, hey, Aww. you've also written all kinds of things, haven't you? Do, you? do you have a particular project that stands out in your mind as a favorite? You know, I don't have necessarily a favorite. Really, when you have, you know, longevity and everything that begins to be favorite moments in each project. You know, a great uh -huh. editor you worked with here, great collaborator there, a collaborator there, and, you know, great moment in this book. So they each have their own special moments, I think. I mean, there's uh -huh. there's a few that I, you know, I'm... <laughs> Are not, are not my favorites. I'll just, just assume say that. forget. Yeah, sure. But, uh, Which ones but, were those, Renee? I, yeah. I want to go read those tonight. <laughs> those have their own backstory that we shall not go into. But but yeah, that's I would say it that way. Well, Jesse, I won't ask you if you have a favorite book you've written, but do you maybe have a favorite author encounter? Ooh, author encounter. Author encounter. Um, God, I have to remember her name now. Um, <laughs> hold up. Was it oh, Renee? It was, yes, it was the first time I wrote Renee. I was so nervous. No, so weirdly enough, a band I like, the lead singer and his wife, wrote a series of books, and they went on tour for the book, and I got to meet both of oh, them. Cool. So I got to meet both the the singer of a band I like and his wife, who wrote a creative thing together, and that was a very interesting like way of interacting with someone who's like music and lyrics I like who mm -hmm. also wrote a story. And so that was, you know, uh, like a delightful way of interacting with somebody who like I had, you know, a huge like, you know, nerd crush on. So, yeah. uh, are you saying we're going to all have to start bands now? I can't. I'm still <laughs> working on social media. I cannot start a band. To, I bet you could. Uh, yeah. I can't. I got you to sing when you're at WriterCon very quietly, but still, you did. <laughs> not publicly. This is not. A, I was of... standing in the back, <laughs> lip syncing. So right. good. So good. Um, uh, I thought that was great. All right. Our interview today, as I mentioned, is with John Woolley, who's a writer, novelist, lecturer, filmmaker, radio and TV host who s specializes in everything, really, but in particular movies, literature, music, pop culture. He's written or co-written or edited almost 50 books, including his new horror trilogy called The Cleansing. That's made up of three books, Seventh Sense Satan's Swine and Sinister Serpent. There is a lot of sibilance yeah. <laughs> and alliteration in those titles. 20th Century Honky Tonk, which is the true story of Kane's Ballroom, and much more. We'll talk to John after this news segment. Jesse, take us away. All right. 
right. News story number one, perhaps unsurprisingly to most of you, is about AI. The revolution continues to roll, right? Thousands of authors are now urging AI companies to stop using their work without permission, and some of them are even suing about this business of programs like OpenAI and Meta scraping the internet to get content. So thousands, including big names like Nora Roberts and Michael Shaban, Margaret Atwood, have signed a letter asking AI companies to stop using their work without permission or compensation, which is just one of many counter offenses the literary world has launched in the last couple of weeks. Some authors, including Sarah Silverman, the comedian, and Paul Tremblay and others, signed on as plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit alleging that, again, OpenAI and Meta trained their programs on pirated copies of their work. A spokesman, well, the CEO of the Authors Guild said, and I quote, it's not fair to use our stuff in your AI without permission or payment. So please start compensating us and talking to us. Renee, what do you think? Uh, first of all, what's this about? Is this about publishing rights or money? Well, to tell you the truth, it's an extremely complicated issue. I mean, it, it, it really is. And I would say it's probably about both. But first and foremost, it, it really is about publishing rights and, and what AI is using and whether a robot can be held accountable for the same <laughs> things that a human can. So it, it's really, really, really complicated. It's, you know, again, these things had to be thrown onto the publishing world, the writing world. The writers are the first ones really having to deal with this sort of thing uh, with AI and other industries will follow. But um, we got to get this sorted out early right. and now or it's going to be a real mess. Well, it's I mean, it's a brand new technology. I think half the Internet was scraped before anybody even <laughs> knew what was sure. going on. And now they're basically asking people to stop doing what they've already done. I don't know. Jesse, do you think that all these offensives offensives are going to accomplish anything? I mean, I think more the more attention you draw to it, the more people will realize it's happening. Sure. I read an article recently about someone who used OpenAI to sort of finish the Game of Thrones book series. <laughs> but better? They, and, well, here's the thing. Oh, you mean finish the book series? Yes, yes, finish the book series, yeah. And oh. the, way, the way they did it was like, they had OpenAI like write a like outline for each character and then take those outlines and expand upon it and then like weave it into chapters. And OpenAI was very good at certain things and very bad mm -hmm. at other things. Like for example, it's terrible at killing characters, right? Hmm. Like it, it just would not kill a main character, which Absolutely. is something it's not in very good it at. Can't harm. Yeah. yeah. And and so it was one of the things where like it is a great tool, but it was it, it's still never going to be as good as a human being who can no surprise kidding. you with things. So it can't, it's not going to be as good right now. I'm just, yeah. it, it, you it know. will write it faster. That's for sure. Yeah. It, it will eventually but, be as good. Yeah. Well, um, if it's some like a nonfiction summary, like we've already reported Amazon is doing now with yeah. reviews and publishing houses. Are you, I mean, that's one thing. Yeah. Uh, my son, Ralph was showing me, I think it's chat GPT and he typed in, give me good interview questions for William Bernhardt <laughs> and clicked it and like instantaneously it had written questions yeah. and they were not only decent questions they reflected knowledge of who I am and what I've written because you know in the blink of an eye it can scan the internet on the other hand do I think that program could do like a novel some kind of creative work from scratch that I would want to read I kind of doubt it. Yeah. Uh, the only reason the guy was able to do that with Game of Thrones was because it had already scrapped all the other Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin work. So it needs it needs a basis. And so yeah. my question is, does ChatGPT know that Renee doesn't care about, you know, mergers <laughs> and layoffs? And AI? Like, that's what I would like to know. Well, let's ask it yeah. Yeah, let's, um, let's for the next show. It'll know now because it's going to scrap this. We'll uh, do an this experiment. So, yeah. 
Well, I mean, you know me, I'm always on the side of the writers. And I think this is, whether it's any good or not, going to take money from writers. Uh, according, I mentioned the Authors Guild. According to them, the median income for a full-time writer last year was $23,000. Good luck living. And <laughs> writers' incomes have right. declined by 42% between... 2009 and 2019 so i really don't think we need some big ai companies or programs sucking profits away okay second news story which doesn't have to do with well it probably does at some level but it's a different slant at any rate and that's about the huge layoffs and buyouts going on right now at penguin random house many top editors at random house people who worked with major writers i mean normally when you hear about layoffs you expect them to be firing the people at the bottom of the totem pole but that's not what's happening here it's people who have been there a while and are successful and probably get paid more so now they're leaving the company as a series of buyouts and layoffs hit penguin random house the largest book publisher in the united states and this is just the latest in a series of shakeups at PRH, which lost both its global and its United States chief executives in the last six or seven months. Those laid off include staff members in many areas, editorial, publicity, sales, more than 60 people. Uh, although it's hard to get all the details because many of them are not authorized to speak publicly, but the company's chief executive wrote an email to staff saying that the book market faced significant cost increases across the board, and that's a trend the company expects to continue. I don't know, Renee, like me, you've been doing this for a while. Is it finally time to start tolling the bell on big corp New York publishing? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I will. Renee, and Chat GPT could have predicted that answer, I think. <laughs> yeah, I should ask Chat GPT to answer for me. But, but I will say this. I will say this. It, companies are only as good as their talent. And mm -hmm. the talent is not just the authors. You know, publishing is great editors, great marketers, great sales folks. Um, it's a team when you're in traditional publishing. And so you can have great writers, but if you don't have great editors behind them and you don't have great marketers, I mean, you know, to, to lose folks like that is a real shame, I think. And, I, you know, I don't know if I'm answering the question or not, but I will say they'll find, hopefully they'll find someplace to go get a home where they deserve to be yeah. because... Mm -hmm. It, it really is sad to see. I, I, I've seen editors, really, really talented editors laid off over the years, and it just breaks my heart. They've been in it for 30 years, worked with some of the biggest authors, and then they're just mm -hmm. gone. And that's, right. that's a real shame. I, I really, really hate that. Jesse, what's your take? You think this is an isolated incident or time period, or is this the, you know, is layoffs the new black for <laughs> publishing well as someone who is an editor in a different field i can tell you it concerns me but i think it's one of those things where for some reason large entities like this don't understand how our capitalistic system works where there are ups and downs and maybe they shouldn't over hire when things mm -hmm. are good and like maybe should have known there was going to be a paper shortage during our the toilet paper crisis of 2020 <laughs> and like a lot of these things could have been predicted, but a lot of these business models are built off of what happened 15, 20 years ago. And That's so true. I think a lot of these editors will find work in other smaller publishers. They might not be making as much as they were here, but isn't Penguin Random House the one that other people keep trying to buy and failing? Or is that Simon Schuster? No, other way around. Okay. Penguin Random House tried to buy Simon and Schuster, but yeah. the DOJ shut them down. Yeah, I, but now Simon and Schuster is still on the auction block. Yeah. I think uh, it's one of those things where I think it'll come back around. I think mm -hmm. people aren't going to stop buying books. I think it's just the way books are priced and the way, I mean, haven't we talked constantly about how like people are buying more books now? Mm-hmm. 
So like, is it ju- is, is there a delayed effect from when people weren't buying books and now are buying books again? And well, I think they're buying books, but not necessarily books published by the big five, and yeah. not necessarily well, not even predominantly at bookstores. Yeah. Maybe move your offices out of New York, people. It's expensive there. Right? Yeah. How about that? For, I mean, we call these New York publishers, but they're all owned by big corporations who are not a resident to New York. They just have offices there. So, yeah, they could move. I should point out, in fairness, that it's not just Penguin Random House. Like I just said, Simon & Schuster is still... Uh, for sale, and th- there's a group trying to buy it. Harper Collins also announced not long ago that they were offering buyouts because they want to cut their North American workforce by 5%. Hachette has also offered buyouts, so it seems to be industry wide. All right, that's enough news. Jesse, cue up the music, and let's talk to John Woolley. John Woolley, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Bill. It's great to be back. Yeah, always great to have you on. Okay, I think you already know what the first question is going to be. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Let me tell you a story about that. So, <laughs> you must Ron, be a fiction writer or something. Ron Wolf and I sold our first book, which which just came out in another uh, uh, edition from uh, Babylon, as you very well right. know. It's we sold what, our the first sixth our, time it's been published or about something. That. Yeah, it's yeah. got the German edition. It, it is. And uh, so it came out in 1983. And I thought I was on my way. Ron and I had written this book, we'd sold it, it had gone to auction in New mm-hmm. York. It was nine years before I sold another book. And there was a lot, you know, one of the books I wrote, uh, my agent got a letter back from a a nice publisher who said that, well, you know, if this were in the 1960s, we'd publish this book, but uh, John Willie could be a major American writer, but we just can't take any kind of a chance on this mid-list stuff now. Mm -hmm. So I was just, it was a long haul. And at one point, very early in the morning, going through one of those dark nights of the soul that every writer has, Mm -hmm. I realized it was a simple equation. You wear them down or they wear you down. That's the Mm -hmm. equation. And that's Mm -hmm. what I tell people. I said, you know, I used to know everything there was to know about books. And now you count the ones I've edited 50 some odd books down the line. I know two things. I know that they either wear you down or you wear them down. And I also know that you need to work every day, take off weekends if you want to, but every weekday at the same time, at the same place. That's Mm -hmm. all I know about writing anymore, you guys, really. Hmm. So I'm getting the impression that there must be a lot of people you've worn down. (laughs) (laughs) It's an ongoing process, Bill. Yeah, Yeah, but without, and we've interviewed a lot of people on this podcast, but more than any other writer, you have written about every kind of writing there is to write. Yeah. Let me try try and make a li- list, and then you tell me what I left out, okay? <laughs> Novels, yeah. nonfiction, yeah. journalism, mm-hmm. music criticism, mm-hmm. histories, mm-hmm. biographies, yeah. horror, yep. plays, mm-hmm. screenplays, mm-hmm. comic books, mm-hmm. uh, a, a comic strip. Yep. I think you've even written trading cards, and I don't even know what that means. What do you mean? You write the backs, <laughs> those, you know, where the text is on the backs of trading cards. Oh, there okay. Was a big trading card boom in the '90s, and it was like a hip thing to do. Trading cards were being published by the like Kitchen Sink Press, mm-hmm. all these different people, and I and I yeah, I did several of those. The Mamie Van Doren trading card set, I did oh. that. Confidential Film magazine tie-in. trading card set. Yeah, I mean, I so yes, I did do trading cards as well. Holy smokes! Okay, yeah. so uh, what's I mean? Normally, people stick to one genre, and you yeah. got like four hundred. Not to mention, <laughs> diff- okay. First, first question first was what did I leave out? Um, let's see. I've done a lot of intro- I've lo- done a lot of introductions, which I love doing to pulp magazine collections. Collections uh, of old pulp magazine writers. Pulps, I've edited right. and, and and written introductions for a lot of those. And really, that's one of the things I love doing the most. 
Mm. Now, am I right in thinking your most recent book is Thanks, Thanks a Lot? I believe that's correct. Yeah. And I happen that's... to have one over here if anybody wants to look. Do I hold it up? Is that what you want me to hold it up? Or is that yes, just Yes, please do. <laughs> well, by golly, there it is right there. It's the biography of the, of the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame disc jockey and country artist, uh, Billy Parker, that I did with Brett Bingham. And on the back, it says, Billy Parker will always be one of the greats. I'm proud that he has this autobiography to really show who he was and still is, Dolly Parton. And there's Dolly's uh, signature there. Fantastic. So, yes. Yeah, that's the oh, latest I, one we've That's the latest one we've had published by, by uh, Babylon, in fact. And, and before that, I want to talk about, because I think this was a big hit for you, 20th Century Honky Tonk. Yes. You mean, oh, that. you mean this one? Oh, uh, <laughs> you're yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, we've done this a few For times. the audience, he's just yeah. got the uh, audio people. He's just got a stack of them, apparently. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, this is a, 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 Brett Bingham once again worked with me on this, and this is a history of the Canes Ballroom for 75 years from 19, uh, 1923 to 2000, however that works out, or however, two, uh, 24 to 1999 or something. Anyway, it's the first uh, 75 years mm -hmm. of the Gaines Ballroom, which is an iconic uh, got place uh, that uh, is known all around the world. And yeah, we've done really well with that book. I'm no, I got to tell you, when I first heard about this book, I thought, well, that'll sell nicely in the Gaines gift shop. But, <laughs> <laughs> but and it I did. was totally yeah. wrong. Yeah. It sold all across the world. You've it sold did. it in Australia. And yes. People I wouldn't even bet had heard of Kane's Ballroom. How did that happen? Well, a lot of acts in the time period that we cover in that book, there were a lot of acts. That was when um, uh, uh, record labels were putting acts on the road and, you know, they'd play these small kind of honky tonk places, these small little dives, uh, which uh, uh, the Canes was a stop for so many of them, because Larry Schaefer, who owned the Canes at the time, would take a chance on anybody. So he booked Van Halen for $1,500. He booked the police for $1,500, helped them buy a van so they could get around. <laughs> I mean, it, it, so there was, so every, all these acts that were going, that they were trying to build up, the, the major record companies at the time, were coming through the Canes Ballroom, and they all, they all seemed to remember it. Wow. Okay, yeah. let's shift gears while I'm thinking about it. And talk about WriterCon, because you're okay. joining us for the big conference Labor Day weekend in Oklahoma yes. City. Yes. You have, in fact, been a frequent, I would say, regular. That's right. But people can see why now. We're never going to run out of things you can talk about. So we <laughs> might as well just keep. Jack of all <laughs> trades, master of none, Bill. That's uh, it. You have yeah. graciously given up your time. What, why? What do you like about conferences and stuff? Well, you know we're all, we're all kind of in the same boat, aren't we? I mean, mm -hmm. we all have, there's writers just share a lot of things and we're all trying to get heard. And we're all trying to, I, I like being around writers. I like hanging out with yeah, writers. Me too. Yeah, you know, it's fun. I mean, and we all like, kind of have a, a certain, there's a certain level of, um, of discourse that you get when you're with people like you. So, you know, when we're at a writer's conference and we start talking about great writers, you don't have to say, you don't have to tell anybody who F. Scott Fitzgerald is. You ask, what's your favorite F. Scott Fitzgerald novel, right? Because right? you've already Absolutely. got that established. Mm -hmm. So that's nice to be just among people uh, people that, uh, that you are like. And then it's also nice because, I mean, I've been doing this since I made the commitment 79 of all things. I'm 74 years old made the commitment in 79 to write full time. And so I've learned a few things along the way. I certainly hope I have. And I like to be able to maybe share that and, and keep people from perhaps having to go through some of the more negative stuff um, for themselves. Even though, as you know, the, the business has changed so radically. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, it's you know. well, that's one more reason you need to get together and exchange exactly. stories about what's going on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure enough. Okay, so we're going to pivot again a okay. little bit and talk about movies. So sure. um, you you write screenplays. You've mm -hmm. had the movies produced. Mm -hmm. um, that's an entirely different beast than a novel yeah. um, and a very different kind of te technical writing, actually, too. Um, so you've, how did you learn to write screenplays, and which of your movies is your favorite? 
Well, you know, I've done mostly documentaries today. Um, I had, I, I've noticed, you know, like everybody else that has anything out, I obsessively watch like um, Amazon.com to see what stuff of mine is selling the best. <laughs> and all of a sudden, an old documentary I did back in like 99 or 97 or something called Hauntings Across America, which was on the Learning Channel. Um, and it was narrated by Michael Dorn. Uh, from one of the Star Trek things. Yes. Yeah, he was our yes, narrator. He's jumping up and down, even though he's off screen right now. But <laughs> he knows who Michael Dorn is too. I'm sorry, go Good. ahead. And so all of a sudden I look and there, that's selling. Um, you know, I did one called Still Swinging, which is about Western Swing, had a sleep at the wheel and Tracy Bird in it. Uh, the, I have a soft spot in my heart for a little feature. And it's funny, right now I'm in the middle of working with RSU TV, which is, uh, which is a... Um, uh, public TV station, my part of the country, on this end of the turnpike. And um, we're working on a, uh, a concept I've wanted to do for years called Tulsa Terrors. Because mm -hmm. Tulsa was the place really where the made-for-home video movie really took off. It was a horror movie called Blood Cult. Made mm -hmm. it for $25,000, grossed a million. And this is 1985. Oh, and... I've been working on this documentary and this is really shaping up really nicely because mm -hmm. I was there. I was working as an entertainment writer for the Tulsa world at the time. So I was on all those sets. I'm in some of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really, really excited about that. But one of the films that we cover is a little basically kind of film festival film that I, I uh, that was based on a one act play I did called cafe purgatory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it had the star of the slime people in it, Bill Boyce, who was in 1962, I think, uh, slime people. He was the young heroic Marine that fought the slime creatures, and he moved to Tulsa, and we became friends. Great cast. It never went anywhere. We never sold a lot of them. I'm very, very proud of it. And, of course, there's Dan Turner, Hollywood detective. Mm. That brought in my love of pulp magazines because that was a character that started in 1934 in the pulp magazine, Spicy Detective. And I mm -hmm. took one of the stories and adapted it to the movies. And it was a made for TV movie came out in 1990 Mark Beastmaster singer as, uh, as uh, Dan Turner and uh, mm -hmm. Tracy Scoggins and Clue Gulliger. And, and gosh, there was a time Paul Bartell was in it. Uh, it was really, a, it was shot in Tulsa. So that was a really I, nice. I thing. was thinking Eddie Hudson was in it. Is that something else of yours? No, Eddie Deason is in it. Oh, well, yeah. one of those Eddie's. <laughs> Eddie Deason is kind of that, um, Eddie Deason is that kind of um, Jerry Lewis kind of character. That was in oh. all, it was 1941, you know, he's in all those things. He plays the operator of the Himalaya ride in it. Uh, oh, I think I was at the first ever public screening of a Cafe Purgatory. I loved that. Thank you so uh, much. It, it wasn't exploitable. I got my copy anyway. <laughs> God bless you. So you're the one. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, like, it, it, it wasn't exploitable. We got good reviews. It was the, um, um, it was the, the Fort Worth Film Festival in 19, ni 1990, I believe. 1999, I'm sorry, Fort Worth Film, Film Festival in 1999, we were uh, the crowd pleaser. We got the crowd pleaser award. Oh, I'll never nice. forget, there was some guy from like some Eastern European country, you know, and they're all like mm -hmm. sort of dour. And he stands up and, and I can't remember where he's like, he's from like, geez, I don't know, uh, uh, Transylvania or somewhere. And mm -hmm. that's not, probably not Transylvania, <laughs> but he's, you know, he's from one of the Eastern European countries. He stands up and he says, I think that people in my country would love this picture, even with the happy American ending. Mm. <laughs> that is quite a compliment. Yeah. Well, yeah. We do that it. well here yeah. in America. Romania. <laughs> Romania, that's where he was. So this Transylvania. So I think he was Romanian. Mm. Anyway, yeah. Okay. But well, you, yeah, I didn't answer your question, Renee. And I, I, you know, I don't know how I learned. See, right, I was writing comic book scripts. So writing comic book scripts and writing movie scripts a lot alike. And when I was at Central State, which is now UCO, University of Central Oklahoma, right. they had a great uh, program, a master's degree program uh, for writers. Uh, Marilyn Harris was, was the uh, writer in residence at the time who had just really hit it big with Hatter Fox, which was a, a novel. That. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, it, was a made, it was a movie of the week on, I think, NBC. And uh, so... I was back, I, went, I was in Vietnam when I was in the Navy. And when I came back in 73, 
um, I went to grad school on the GI Bill because mm -hmm. I was, a, and so we had all these people. They had a Wanda Duncan and her husband were teaching a script writing class. So that's probably where I learned because she had, okay. she had done a lot. I see her, I, you know, when you watch those old, like have gum will travel and stuff, you see her, her credits uh, yeah. a, a lot on it. And she was teaching there. So that's probably where I learned initially. Okay. And yeah. that was what that was long before we had script writing. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. You had to That's format and macro it and hell, we together. barely yeah. we barely had typewriters then, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so still on the film topic, um, as the official expert on Oklahoma film, uh, you've curated a recent exhibit at the Oklahoma History Center. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Talk Oklahoma at the movies. That was because um, they had contacted me down there. That's Bob Blackburn at the time. Larry O'Dell was down there and Jeff Moore. And they called when they were doing an earlier exhibit, which was called Another Hot Oklahoma Night. And it was an exhibit on Oklahoma rock and roll. And asked me, they were doing, um, what do you call it, an exhibit book? What do you call those things when they do a hardcover book to go along with the exhibition? Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, and they yeah. asked me to, yeah, asked me to write a couple of stories for it. Because for, through the Tulsa world and other things, I learned quite a little bit about Oklahoma music and, and written quite a little bit about it. And uh, I said, yeah, what's it pay? And they said, oh, well, it doesn't pay anything, but, you know, we'll, uh, we'll uh, make it up down the line. Well, <laughs> you guys, right? How many times yeah. you heard that? You know, yeah, well, my, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but I, I went ahead and did it. I mean, the, I knew the book was going to be nice and everything. Well, then about six months later, they called me and they said, how'd you like to be a, uh, how would you like to be a guest curator for uh, Oklahoma at the movies exhibit? Wow. And this is what it pays. Oh, so it was actually, I got a, I did. Oh, it worked they out. They didn't lie. I've got a paying gig out of it. It was a good they, paying gig. They made it up to you. They no. did indeed. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all this stuff about, you know, movies and uh, contracts, that's, but what people really want to hear about is celebrities, right? Yeah. So what's, what's your best celebrity story? Well, I don't know if I can tell it. Is it okay to use a <laughs> you can. word on the air? Okay. <laughs> um, my best celebrity story, the one I always tell, is the one about Ray Charles. Okay. All right. And there will be one, just a warning, folks. There's one bad word in it. So I was interviewing Ray Charles. And, of course, the big thing to remember, like in the newspaper business and stuff, they always want you to interview the star that's coming to town by phone because – if you wait till they get there, it's not going to do anybody any good. If you do them by phone and then the story comes out early, it'll help sell tickets. Right. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. You know, it'll, uh, a star interview helps sell papers. Uh, your interview helps sell tickets for the star. So I was interviewing Ray Charles and talking to him on the phone. And I'm a big Bob Wills, Texas Playboys fan. Good Western right. Swing really took off in Tulsa. And so I was asking, I said, uh, I asked, I said, Mr. Charles, I had him on the phone. I said, Mr. Charles, you know who Bob Wills is. And uh, he says, you kidding me? Of course I did. And, and we're talking. I said, it seems like you did the same thing that Bob Wills did, only coming from a different way. You know, you did your modern sounds in country and Western music, which you're a, a, a rhythm and blues artist, and you went to country music. Bob was a country music artist who absorbed blues and rhythm and blues into his music. In fact, I told Mr. Charles, uh, his, best, his favorite singer was Bessie Smith, the blues mm -hmm. artist. And Ray Charles said, well, I didn't know that. He says, you know who my favorite artist was when I was growing up? I said, no, sir. He says, Grandpa Jones. <laughs> now, Renee, you're too young. Bill is like, because <laughs> Bill remembers Grandpa Jones from Hee Haw. Of Hee Haw little, fame, little yeah. glasses and a little hat. Oh, okay. And okay. Banjo, okay. Right? He was a musician. Like you would never put him with Ray Charles in a thousand years. Hmm. So we were talking. So anyway, I got done. He says, I'd like to see you um, when I come to town. He was playing at the, what was the Brady Theater then. And I never went backstage unless they specifically asked like that. And, and I said, sure, I'd be happy to meet you. He didn't want to meet Ray Charles. So I remember when it was because the Hansons had just hit with Mbop. Yep. And they were backstage. I think it's Mbop, mm isn't it? Mbop. Mm yeah. Mm -bop. <laughs> so they were backstage wanting to get their picture taken with Ray Charles, right? And I was backstage visiting with them. I'm visiting with everybody. And 
uh, he's in the green room and the, the, the road manager opens the door and he says, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Charles isn't feeling well. Um, he's not going to be able to see anybody tonight. So I said, okay. And uh, I walked up and I had a copy of my story. And I said, I told Mr. Charles, I'll bring him a copy of the story. So here it is. And thank you. And tell him hello for me. Started to leave. And I ran into somebody I knew I was talking. Door opens again, right? Road mm. manager comes out and he says, that journalist still here? Mm. I said, yes, sir. I'm over here. He says, Mr. Charles wants to see you. So here I go into the green room and he, man, he looks like Ray Charles, you know, I mean, he's got those <laughs> black and he's got this leisure suit. That's kind of tan with these chocolate accents. He grabs my hand and he says, you remembered, you remembered. Mm. And I said, well, of course I remembered Mr. Charles. I said, I said, this is so great to me. She says, well, what'd you think about the show? And I said, well, frankly, Mr. Charles, I was a little disappointed. He stops says, you were. And I said, yes, sir. I said, I watched the whole show and you didn't do one Grandpa Jones song. <laughs> and he started that Ray Charles laughing and rocking back and forth. And he gets right nose to nose with me. And he says, man, you got to have the right kind of cats to play that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my favorite celebrity story. I knew I'd always remember what Ray Charles told me. Yeah. Wow. That's a great one. <laughs> Okay, well, we're already practically, ta we are talking about music, but I want to make the point that you are also yourself a musician and have written many things. But of course, the one I want to talk about is that song that was covered by Steve Ripley, yeah. Red Dirt Rangers, and then yeah. the Oak Ridge Boys, right? Oak, uh, it was a uh, Whisper and Bill Anderson with the Oak Ridge Boys, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's called Gone Away. Uh -huh. uh, S Steve Ripley and I went back to uh, Stillwater. Uh, he's younger than I, was younger than I, uh, but we were both at the radio station. At the time, I was at OSU, which was 66 through 70. The campus radio station was a rock and roll station, KVRO. And if you, and I was a biology major of all things, go figure. But uh, because I'll tell you exactly why I was a biology major. I wanted to write. I had a grandmother who wrote. I wanted to write from when I was a kid. And my mom, who was a depression era, Oki said, this writing's fine, but get something you can fall back on. So I got biology. I worked my biology degree for seven months when Ralston Purina's plant opened in Edmond. I was the first plant sanitarian lab analyst there. I would have gone back to the service before I took it. <laughs> they had to hold it open for me. I said, no, thanks, guys, you know. Uh, but mm. I'm sorry, I got up, got off track a little bit. So anyway, Steve and I knew one another from Stillwater because we both were at the radio station. I took that as an elective, DJing as an elective. And then mm. when I went to the service, I was the um, program director for the ship's radio station. I was a heli on a helicopter carrier called the USS New Orleans. And uh, so I was all kind of full of radio. Well, I came back and uh, Steve at the time got, was working with the church studio and putting the tractors together. And so we re got reacquainted. Well, after that, 94, I believe it was, um, Steve calls me one day and he says, look, he says, I'm wanting to write a nostalgia song called Gone Away. Mm -hmm. He says, I've already got Tim Dubois who was then the head of Arista, uh, Arista Nashville Records. Uh, and he was from Locust Grove, I believe. And he's got Tim Dubois, has a couple of lines in it. He says, I, you got anything that you might want to add? So, I, I mean, Steve was on. I mean, these guys were, this was, the tractors were a big deal. This was his first solo album mm -hmm. after the tractors or in between the tractors. And he says, you want to help? And so I wrote a bunch of, I don't know how much he used, not a whole lot of it, but I got 10% of the song. And it came out and it was his first single. Well, in order to uh, be listed as a songwriter, I had to start my own uh, publishing company and register it with BMI, right. Broadcast Music for the, the, for the rights distribution. Mm -hmm. So it cost $150. And Steve hooked me up with my guy. So I had laughed, thought I'd die music and we had gone away and I'm listed on the credits uh, as a songwriter. Well, it was the first single off that album. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of airplay all around the country. I got one check from BMI for 81 cents <laughs> to this day. So to this day, I'm in the hole, like, you know, 149.19 or whatever it is. To, to be in but by God, and then, and then, uh, Whisper Bill Anderson and the Oak Ridge Boys picked it up. 
and recorded it, but it never, it made a little noise, but these days it's like royalties for books. Mm -hmm. Songwriting royalties are so small. We were in a film, the song was in a film called The Round and Round and uh, really? a lot of things, but so far I've made 81 cents on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Congratulations. John. Yeah, Thank on you. your, uh, <laughs> did you cash it or frame it? Oh, well, I Xeroxed it. <laughs> oh, hell, yo, hell, and yeah, then you, cashed you, you it, of course you did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Worst piece of writing advice you've ever received or wait for, heard. Wait for the muse. Oh, that's, oh, yes, yes that's, I gotcha. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. Oh, no. And yeah. I thought it should be tell, tell your muse when to show up because <laughs> I'm going to be up in that chair at 6 a.m. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. It's up to the muse. It's, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, people will tell, tell you, oh, you know, you know, just wait for inspiration. You you can't do it. I, a matter of fact, I tell when I do stuff like uh, uh, WriterCon, I always tell people it's like um, I knew I was a professional writer the day I wrote when I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. The first day I wrote when mm -hmm. I didn't want to write, mm -hmm. I knew I was a pro. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't wait. It, it, life's mm -hmm. too short. Interesting. Well, I, I'm dying to ask this question because, John, I honestly don't know how you do all this. Like, mm. it just blows my mind. Just <laughs> what it, I mean, there's only 24 hours in a day. Yeah. How what do you. So this is the question. Um, so you clearly have a writing day. Yeah. And what does that look like? What does your writing day look like? What's the time of day? What do you drink? What's the. What's the process? Well, I do drink, but I mean, it's not, <laughs> not are those two separate things? <laughs> yeah, the writing day so, yeah, and later yeah, the drinking. That's at the end of the writing day. Gotcha. Uh, no, it, uh, usually I'm up at six o'clock, walk the dog, do the exercise bike, have breakfast. I'm usually at the typewriter or not the typewriter. Sorry, I'm usually at the computer by around eight, and I knock off about twelve thirty and have lunch, and then I go back up between one and two. And write until four or five. L usually, I keep the the stuff that's. Gosh, I hate the term because. Hey, what do you guys think of making creative into a noun? Like I've been hearing so much of lately. <laughs> Isn't that just the worst thing ever? So I didn't want to uh, use the term creative, but the more creative yeah. stuff, you know, that may, that I, I always do that in the morning. If I'm transcribing an interview or something more onerous or more rote like that, I save that for the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. it just doesn't seem like you have enough hours in the day to also host a radio show well, and mm -hmm. all the all the things, but you're definitely an inspiration that I really feel like I'm a slacker. And, and <laughs> I've got to get myself no, it's going. Not that, no, it's not that much of an inspiration. Believe me, you just, you know, writers are driven, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you're driven to create. It's very important. And when that's the most important thing, everything else has to fall along those lines, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sure. John, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, I love dancing and with you as always. And we'll see you at WriterCon, where we're going to hang out with all the creatives, right? All of us <laughs> creatives will be hanging out with one another. Yeah, we are. <laughs> That's right. Uh, see you soon, John. Okay. Thanks a lot. Just a few parting words. Renee, talk about your success with the ScreenCraft Contest finalist right finalist yes it was amazing round Thank of applause Woo. absolutely absolutely they just uh they've announced the winner um it wasn't me but uh really winning finalist on screencraft is uh is a oh, big deal huge. and it will yeah. give me a lot of um i don't know a lot of uh, open doors to this project that i'm working on so i'm excited about it the screencraft folks have been amazing um and gotten to know them so uh yeah i'm pretty excited yeah, pretty excited con well congratulations it's always Thanks. good to see good deserving people get recognized like you well, and thanks. of course I'm going to say something about WriterCon. I've been talking about WriterCon for weeks and probably won't stop till September 1st. But 
I did notice, uh, looking back, I usually talk about kind of the big group stuff, classes and pitches and contests and whatnot. I, uh, I wanted to make the point that we also provide many opportunities for a small group or even private or one-on-one -on -one encounters, like the manuscript reviews, which actually was a very brilliant Renee idea, and the private consultations. Basically, when you sign up for those, you know, you pick from a list of our speakers who you want to read your manuscript or whose brain you want to pick and talk to for a while. And then, you know, they'll read or prepare in advance and they'll schedule it. And you'll get a half hour to talk to whoever it is you've selected about your work or to ask questions that you really need some answers to. And I think that's just, a, you know, it's, it's a great addition. It's a large scale conference, but with a lot of small scale stuff stuff uh you know that's why we talk about writer con being a family and that that's why we see so many people leaving not only with knowledge and inspiration that they need to succeed but also with friends you know people it, it, it's sometimes hard to find other people who have the same bizarre desire to write <laughs> that you do but they're all over writer con and people make friends and stay in touch and, and change exchange chapters and i just love seeing that happen anyway writer con it's september one through four that's labor day weekend in oklahoma city for more information please visit our website which predictably is writercon.com all right until next time keep writing and remember you cannot fail if you refuse to quit see you next time